Hello everybody and welcome to the channel. Jim here and today we have a treat. It's been a little bit of a summer break for us. I haven't posted up any videos for a little while and today I have an interview with someone who is about to take their open water certification. This is Tammy from the Northeast and she's going to take her certification soon and she has some questions that some of you out there might have about your certification that's upcoming. So let's have a look and a chat with Tammy. Here we go. Tammy, thank you so much for joining the channel today. Thank you uh, you uh, sent me a bunch of, of great uh, questions that you have, and we're going to discuss those today. Yeah. And let's get to it. Okay. So the first thing I, I want to ask, actually, is mm -hmm. so pardon me. So you're you're not certified. I am not. And uh, right. And what's your what's your history? You're like a swimmer. You're you like the ocean, or what's the deal there? Yeah, I, I've definitely always um, loved to go to the aquarium and everything and thought how great it would be to be inside there. So, you know, decided to make the leap and get certified. All right. <laughs> Let's get to your questions. All right. So what do you want to talk about first? Um, I would love to um, learn more about the class that I'm going to be taking. What should I look for in a certification program? Okay, so you already, I think you identified a class near you, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Like a, a dive center, something mm -hmm. like that. Did you, were you, were you going through a few different choices? How did you decide on the one that's near you or, or the one nearest you? What did, what did you decide? Was it just location or yeah, recommendation or what? It's really close to me, um, uh, so I can get to it very easily. They offer a lot of excursions and trips and everything. It looks like they're really legit, so... Um, I thought they look professional. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so you mentioned a couple of important things. So they have, obviously, they have education. They have trips. That's really important, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. you want, they, they usually say, what is it, the, the three, <laughs> let me see, the three E's, was it? Or education, excursions, and equipment, I think. So if someone has all is that what things, they say? it's like a good dive center. Oh, that's what well, they say. You, you know, go. they, yeah. Great. Yeah. Learn something today. But the most important thing is your instructor, is the instructor. Right. So yeah. you want to mm -hmm. uh, ask around, find a good instructor, like you said, safe. And what I'd really look for is someone who has good emphasis on education and not necessarily like a shortness of a course, because that's very often a problem. Right. Someone making courses too short because they want to maximize mm -hmm. their profit, maybe. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you're nice and comfortable. So what I really look for, especially in your open water course, um, if it's a two-day open water course, I'd be a little bit suspicious. Okay. Probably most of them are three days. Mine's four days, so people can really ease into it. But uh, I would say definitely minimum a three-day. And also find out, like, hey, instructor, what happens if, you know, three days, you know, I, I can't do it, I'm not comfortable or something. What, what, what's, what's the B plan? That's something you might want to find out. Okay. What's the B plan? Great. Good. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I kind of cover what I should stay away from. Um, what will I learn in the program? Right, you're gonna learn all the basics, everything, right? You have knowledge development, mm -hmm. uh, there's gonna be a test, there's a book to read. Mm -hmm. um, you're gonna read everything about like light physics, light marine biology, uh, about your equipment, uh, emergency procedures, how to do the things uh, that you need to do to dive safely and enjoyably. Uh, you're gonna be tested on all those and a written test uh, you're going to be in a pool to practice these things in a controlled environment. And then you're going to go, bam, to the ocean and practice these things and demonstrate these things in an ocean environment for four dives and what demonstrate things? to your instructor. What am I demonstrating? Ah. That I yeah, can all the breathe underwater? Like how to, how, that I'm not holding my how breath? How to use your equipment? How to use my equipment? Yep. How to use your equipment safely. Yeah. Um, how to uh, buddy procedures and uh, emergency procedures, sharing air right. and things like um, that. Let me just uh, interject here on the buddy thing. Um, what if I'm doing this alone? I don't have a buddy. Good point. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll hook you up with someone. Yeah, either, either <laughs> not that kind of a hookup. No. Uh, Darn. What do do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What to do is, uh, so what, what I would do is, so hopefully I'm going to have uh, more than one student, but if I don't, what they'll do is they'll, um, it might be, you might be lucky, it might be a one-to-one -one situation and just be you and an instructor, yeah, could be. Or be they might have uh, a dive, 
yeah, it might have a dive master that, that would be your, your training partner, um, or it might be another senior student who kind of uh, is going to be your buddy, like for your independent dives mm. or things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you don't have to worry if you go alone. Uh, any, any good dive center is going to be able to accommodate you alone or with a friend. Okay. Okay. So what do you think are the most common obstacles that beginners face when they're learning to dive? Yeah. Yeah. Number one challenge is, is ears. ears. So, um, and, and, th yep. and that's usually, that's usually with people who are afraid to train in my experience. So they were very often someone who came along with someone else, or they're not sure they're a little bit scared. Um, those people very often will have ear trouble. Like it's, I, I think of it as a form of resistance, but, uh, anybody who can ride a plane, an airplane, or go up a mountain, come down a mountain, mm. and adjust their ears. Okay. Uh, they should be able to do with, with diving as well. So that's one major challenge. Mm -hmm. um, let me see. Uh, some other folks, maybe uh, fear, like just, uh, again, these are usually folks who don't want to be training anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> in my experience. Yeah. So, yeah, they're just going to be afraid of the water, afraid of seeing fish even, uh, you know, kind of general fear. Um, Okay, yeah. since we are talking about fears, um, let's just jump down yeah. to the question that I get from a lot of my friends who when I talk about that I want to do scuba diving. Um, oh, let's hear what's it. going on with the sharks? Yeah, that's your big fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I'm in their house. So for you, all right, mm -hmm. for you, this, this is a number one, and I hear you. Mm -hmm. So... Um, from from a diver standpoint, mm. you know, if you if you have a look at at the statistics, um, it's right. I, I know that anecdotally, the idea of of a shark doing something bad to you is a really bad idea, right? I mean, it's it's a terrible fear, mm. but uh, statistically, statistically, it's incredibly uh, improbable, right? Incredibly improbable. And uh, to boot, most sharks uh, that you would go to purposely look at are, are very harmless to humans in, in general, right? Like nurse sharks, a lot of mm -hmm. bottom feeding sharks, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have bony plates, mm -hmm. they eat lobsters and, and clams and, you know, not, not things like us, not even fish, some of them. Okay. And then the fish eating ones, right? They're, they're not really well, uh, well built. Right. to attack something as big as them. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, personally myself, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I'm swimming on top of the ocean, you know, I'm feeling very vulnerable. Yeah. Right. I can't see anything under me. Right. right? I can't see right. anything if right. I'm snorkeling or yeah. if I'm swimming. It'd be nice to have a spotter. I, I feel, exactly. So, but when you're down, I will guarantee you, when you're down in the water and you're you're looking around, you're going to feel like, like one of the pack, right? And if you do happen to get lucky and, and see a shark, it's going to be, <laughs> For most people, it's a thing of enjoyment, right? And and usually they're pretty shy, actually. You know, they don't really want to hang around us. And in fact, very often, like a lot of the sharks I've seen in the past, you barely see them. Like they're way off in the distance mm -hmm. and like they, they know what the visibility is and they'll just like be right on the edge of visibility and then poof, they're gone. Interesting. And like, hey, did you see that shark? No, mm -hmm. I missed it. Where was it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. And then, but, but then last, most of the sharks, like, like you might have seen on some of my videos, like hammerheads, the hammerheads here, the scalloped mm -hmm. hammerheads, yeah. hundreds of yeah. them, hundreds yeah. of them. And they, it's an amazing yeah, video. right. Those, those sharks. Yeah. Thank you. So in, in all of recorded shark history, apparently those, those scalloped hammerheads, for example, there have been something like 12, 12 attacks in all of recorded history. You know, granted that's maybe a few hundred, three, 400 years. Mm -hmm. And none of them were fatalities, and I don't know what the situations were, but um, you know, it just by and large, it's just not a thing that that you know sharks do. They they have a lot more to fear from us, um, commercially yeah, speaking. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I just don't want to be nibbled on while I'm out there. I hear you. Mm. Very. It's highly unlikely. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Coming right back to you if I am. Um, all right. So. Uh, Away from the sharks now, back. Please um, do. <laughs> what are the costs around starting out? How, how much is this going to set me back? 
Yeah, great question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to depend on uh, your area of the world. And so, for example, here in Japan, it's kind of expensive, yeah. probably. Uh, it's probably in the neighborhood of $1,000 because we, we have to pay relatively high costs for all of our dives. Whereas some places, like in Florida, mm -hmm. You know, you your dives might be near zero costs if you um, like the, if the dive center is near a beach and if they can just walk in the beach, or if they have to pay for a boat, that's going to be more expensive. So it depends on the dive situation. I would guess. I mean, like in Florida, when I used to live there, you could go down the street and say, "Oh, scuba certification, two hundred dollars," you know, or two ninety nine. But then maybe it's plus other fees or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. What What's the place that you're looking at? Uh, it was several hundred dollars just for the education. Yeah. 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 And then the dives are extra. Mm, I believe so. Um, yeah. I'm not sure about the gear, though. Like, do I have to buy something? Am I going to be using their gear? Um, how does that work? Right. And how does that work yeah. with COVID? Great question. Yeah, yeah. Great questions. Um, so for me... I, it sounds like I might charge kind of like that place charge. So I, I have like an education fee and then, you know, everything is modular. So the education fee itself, that would include the certification material. Uh, I'm sorry, the certification, like your card fees and whatever. Uh, and then there's materials fee, right? So there's textbooks. Mm -hmm. Now there's online or things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, that's usually, I don't know, maybe about a hundred bucks or less. And then there are the dives. Mm -hmm. And that depends case by case. Like I said, maybe some places that the dives would be just the cost of the tank if you're walking into the water in Florida. Or it might be the cost of boat diving, which maybe that's $100 for two dives. I really don't know. Depends on the area of the world. Um, some places will include the, the equipment rental for free for mm -hmm. your course. Uh, that's generally what, what I tend to do. Um, some places will require you to buy your mask, snorkel, and fins. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and those and those three, uh, depending on you know how fancy, you could probably go as little as a hundred fifty bucks, maybe for those three, for you know a hundred to one hundred fifty for a okay. cheap set, all the way up to maybe you know two hundred, mm. two fifty for like a really really nice mask and and some some nice fins. And that last um, could could cost you a couple hundred. Oh, okay. yeah. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The expense is yeah. worth it then. And as, yeah. in terms of, yeah. Okay. And in terms of COVID, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know what folks are doing with their regulators. I, I don't know what the survivability mm -hmm. is of the virus in an uh, aquarium environment, a marine mm -hmm. environment. I, I'm sure that places are, are rinsing their gear and stuff like that. So um, I'm guessing it's, it's not a high risk uh, environment for the spread, but you should inquire with the dive center if you have any concerns there. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned tanks. Um, how, how heavy are those tanks? They're heavy. <laughs> oh, great. So um, heavier. there should be a certain level of fitness that somebody should have before trying to do this. Yeah, they're heavy and they're getting heavier for right. me every year. So, yeah. Um, so depending, <laughs> depending, yeah, depending on your dive environment. So, for example, I'm uh, here a big uh, shore diving environment and shore diving is the worst, especially sometimes you have really long walks. So you got all the stuff on your back, right? The tank on your back and you have a, you know, a, yeah. a, a hundred, 200, 300 yard walk to the water. It's, you know, it's work. However, boat diving is relatively <laughs> little work because you're going to, you're going to be sitting down, you're going to put the tank on, you're going to get up, you're going to walk mm -hmm. five meters and then jump in. Right. So boat mm -hmm. diving is definitely less work. Um, that being said, I remember you, you did tell me you have a, a, a back issue and uh, anybody who mm -hmm. has a health issue where they shouldn't be mm -hmm. exerting a lot or exerting themselves in certain ways like a back, uh, you definitely want to tell that to your instructor and they can make, um, they can make uh, accommodations for that, right? So, because even, mm -hmm. even, you know, handy abled people can dive, right? I mean, the folks without arms and legs and, and whatnot. So someone with a bad back, right. certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Someone with a bad back can, can work it out. Um, how much does it cost to do a few dives a year? Again, it depends on shore dives or what. I mean, if you live in Florida, if you have your own gear, if you have your own tank, you could go and get a tank fill for, I think, under $10 down at the local fill station and 
drive to the beach and go diving for ten dollars if you have all those things right if not mm. if not right if you have to rent your gear I don't know how much that is in the states you know for me it's uh, probably like you know fifty sixty seventy dollars a day right for if you need full full gear rental um, and then if you're you know going to go on a boat dive that might be like a hundred bucks for two dives I don't know so you know a dive mm -hmm. outing could be anywhere from ten dollars if you have all your stuff to two fifty if you don't have anything and you take a boat to a nice location so um, yeah, that would be that would, per outing. That would be what you'd be looking at, I guess. At two fifty, up to, right? It's cheaper than a theater ticket, I can tell you that. So, starting out, I should probably rent my gear. Absolutely. See what I like. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, any kind of gear, any kind of like wetsuits I should look at. Any brands that you like. You know, I would have a look uh, at your your local dive shop, right? So yeah, rent again. You know, um, rent rent something. You know, see see what what you like, what they recommend, what they carry. Dive with other people. You know, rent for a little while, see what's out there. A, a wetsuit is a pretty mm -hmm. personal piece of equipment because some people take liberties with those rental suits that you might not want libertied in your suit that you're borrowing. So, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, okay. So, owning my suit, <laughs> um, what am I? Uh, I think I saw that there's different thicknesses, yeah, it's going to depend on your environment. So, again, this is mm -hmm. a place where you could depend on your, your local dive buddies and your instructor. So, you know, here in Japan, mm -hmm. a five millimeter suit is like the standard five millimeter wetsuit, five mm -hmm. millimeter full. Mm -hmm. uh, in Florida, mm -hmm. for example, you know, it might be people with uh, two or three millimeter shorties or three, three millimeter mm -hmm. full suit or dive skins mm -hmm. in the summer. There's a lot of different choices. So, um, you're going to probably want to look at uh, the environment that you're going to dive in and talk to the people who dive in that environment and get some advice there. Okay. Um, should I have any other kind of equipment? Should I have dive knives? Um, should I have a cattle prod, a something to keep big fish away? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd say no, no, and no on that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think Big, no, I will no, no. cut you if you come near me, fish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd wait on all that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, usually by the time my students get to around around advanced, I want students to definitely have a compass, right, so they could do navigation. And around rescue, I want students to have some sort of a cutting device to get themselves out of an entanglement, uh, a line or a net. Um, open water, I think it's really good in the beginning to have nothing else to worry about except you and your instructor mm -hmm. and your dive buddy. You want to have mm -hmm. too many other things. So in the beginning, I wouldn't really worry about any other equipment other than like if the shop gives you a computer to, uh, to borrow, um, that's a nice tool to have, but ask your instructor. They might want to use tables, but uh, but that, that's down the line. In terms of tools in the beginning, I'd recommend nothing, and then see what other people use. But anyway, mm -hmm. but I will tell you this: mm -hmm. as a guy, I, I, as a guy who's been in scuba a long time, I have a great big closet at home that is filled with scuba regret. <laughs> right, <laughs> stuff, stuff. <laughs> That I was bought or I was given, I'm never going to use. Uh, it's just so there's a lot of that around. So nothing to be ashamed of. We, we're all going to do it. But uh, I, time, let, let time see what see what other people use and what works and what doesn't work. My advice uh, about these suits. Now tell me, um, am I going to be cold? And how good are they at keeping me warm? Um, like you said, I'm in the Northeast, so probably going to be diving where it's a little chilly. Good point. It's a great question. Um, now, people do break down into people who get cold easily and people who don't get cold easily. Uh, I, I apparently, you, you get cold easily, yeah. So apparently mm -hmm. I get cold easily yeah. compared to some folks. You know, sometimes I'll be wearing a dry suit, which is like the warmest suit you can, while there are other people in that same group who are wetsuit 
and you know doing just fine you know sometimes they're you know maybe young strong guys or something or sometimes some women it you know you never know um uh, again you're going to want to you know pick the brains of the people that you dive with and uh the instructors typically speaking i hate to say this but uh, women tend to get cold uh, easier in my experience and tend to not gravitate so much uh, to cold water diving as as men. Um, and part Why of that, is that? Part of it. Kind of part feel of like it, got a little more body fat on him, honestly. Yeah. Men. Part of part of it is a, uh, a surface area to volume ratio issue. Um, so, yeah. So the so thin people. So statistically speaking, thin, long people are, have more surface area to volume, so they're going to give off um, the heat to the environment faster than you know the, the perfectly <laughs> shaped person would be a, a sphere, right? <laughs> like a seal, <laughs> like a seal, right? A seal is very right modular, very very clumpy, and uh, so they have a lot of volume and not a lot of surface area compared to their volume. So you know okay. that, that's the way it works. But yeah, you it's case by case. But women tend to get colder a little bit, a little bit more. Okay. Um, regarding the gear now, um, what's with the snorkels? Why do I see them on people? I wouldn't think you could use them underwater. So what's the point? Yeah, that's a very big debated topic. So uh, uh, the people who, well, for training standards, you're, you have to have a snorkel on your person mm -hmm. somewhere. For, for most agencies that I know of, as a training standard. And it is a, a self-rescue device potentially, right? So if you ran out of air and if you're somewhere with waves and you had to swim through those waves and and have a, a safe, protected airway, uh, a snorkel in that case would be a piece of life-saving equipment, right? Um, okay. However, however, most, many people do not plan on being in that situation. And they, you know, I, I have a folding snorkel personally. I don't like having a snorkel on my mask. A lot of people don't who are experienced divers. But your instructor for your course will tell you what he wants you to wear during that course. And he or she may require you to wear a snorkel on your mask, and that's just what you're going to have to do, right? Um, other instructors like myself, so in the beginning we will train with it on the mask, and it's also folding and can go in a person's pocket for their later dives. Uh, however, I have you, never seen a folding snorkel. Yeah, they, they roll up. I, I love them. They're great. So after certification, um, when should I take advanced certification? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people are in a hurry to, to get advanced. And uh, well, first of all, what advanced does is it gives you some more environmental experience. It lets you go a bit deeper, uh, open water is generally limited to 18 meters or, or 60 feet. Um, however, with, uh, with advanced, uh, most charters will allow you to go to 30 meters, which is, gosh, what is that? That's about 100 feet or something like that. And uh, so it's gonna, it's gonna let you go to more, um, it's gonna allow you to go deeper and it's going to hopefully prepare you for like more challenging environments. You're gonna do a night dive or a low visibility dive. You know, you might learn to use a piece of equipment or why would do I do a night dive? dive? Oh, because there's great stuff to see at night, stuff that doesn't come out during the day. It's much more peaceful than you might think. Yeah. So uh, I would wait. I personally, I would wait. A uh, person who's going to want to do advanced, wait until you have your, your basic buoyancy skills down. Right. You're not going to float to the surface when you don't want. You're not going to mm -hmm. be hitting on the ground. You're going to have relative good control of your, of your, uh, your buoyancy. You know how mm -hmm. to use your equipment without another person's help. You could take it on, put okay. it off, take it apart, put it together. Um, and you know, usually for many people, that's going to be like 20 to 40 dives is what I would recommend. Mm. Um, how many dives a year should I do to stay proficient? It's a great question. Yeah, great question. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. there's no answer to that. But I figure, you know, you figure what if you could go out I don't know, what could a person do? Maybe, you know, could a person do easily 10 weekends? You know, average person 10 weekends or 10 single days a year, then that would be two dives each, that'd be 20. I mean, you know, if someone could do a minimum 20 dives a year, I think that would be for many people the minimum. But we're kind of talking about this is an athletic endeavor 
and you know not everybody remembers how to ride a bike as easily as mm-hmm. other people and their knowledge right. some people need to be refreshed more so mm-hmm. if you're really good hand eye coordination and you know you know have a very good memory for systems and you like you know maybe putting stuff together and the marine environment maybe you'll need fewer dives uh, but if uh, if you're someone who like was really nervous in the course and you know maybe didn't finish so strongly anyway you might take more okay mm-hmm. um what is the most important thing for a new diver to remember um you mean a dangerous thing yeah like um i'm down there and i'm i'm doing my thing and everything um looking around it's should i be a little OCD, check in my meters or anything, like um, how often should I be doing that? Like um, what um, would you say once you're down there, what's the most important thing that you should be doing? Oh, good point. Um, yeah, so paying attention, as you said, right? So there, you'll learn this in your course, but you have to mm-hmm. pay attention to your air. Mm-hmm. You have to pay attention to your, your nitrogen exposure right? Your air is going to be an air gauge of some kind. Mm-hmm. Your nitrogen exposure is going to be either, uh, either a computer or a timing device, right? And your depth. So your depth would be hopefully on the computer or some other device. Um, and pay attention to your buddy, mm-hmm. right? So, so for me, you know, I'm, I'm going to be down there. I'm looking around. I look at this. Hey, look at that fish. Mm-hmm. Look at this thing. Oh, there's my buddy. Okay, hey, looking around more. Hey, there's this. Oh, my gosh, look at that over there. There's my buddy. So every so few seconds, checking, every three. Yeah. Hmm. Every few every seconds. Every three, four, five seconds. Yeah. And and personally, you know, you probably want to be within a few meters of your buddy, you know, okay. in the beginning. Um, but okay. mostly in the beginning, uh, kind of contributing to this, dive as much as possible. Right? You want to get mm-hmm. up uh, to a level of comfort and familiarity that that you're you're comfortable in the water you know your gear you feel comfortable you control yourself which makes you enjoy it more they're going to want to do it more it's going to be safer when you're safe you're happy right nobody likes to feel unsafe and you don't know what you're doing Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. you want to dive enough to get comfortable uh dive with good buddies that you trust and enjoy and have fun with Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. uh, dive as much as possible okay all right um so uh like you said, you've been doing this for many years. Uh, what keeps you coming back to this? That's great. That's a great question. Um, and I've talked to a lot of instructors uh, about this. Um, and people who stick with, I think, any activity over time, their reason changes. Right? Maybe in the beginning, maybe mm-hmm. it's a physical challenge. You know, they, they like the physical mm-hmm. challenge of it. Or, you know, they just like being on the ocean. Then maybe someone will get bored with that a little bit. Oh, get into photography or get into maybe a certain kind of creature that they like to see or a certain area or they, oh, I like wrecks or I like, you know, researching about the wrecks and then diving the wrecks Mm -hmm. Um, or I've always wanted to dive freshwater. There's some creature I want to learn about. So people's reasons uh, very often change over time with, with, I think with any activity, right? I mean, maybe it's like that with gardening, right? If you were a gardener, you want to you know, how, how I'm getting bored as a gardener, you know, try some different plant or different mm-hmm. seasonal plant or something okay. like that. So probably yeah. your, your reason needs to change. Mm-hmm. Okay. As a beginner diver, are there certain things that I should see? Like, uh, what would you suggest that would really capture my imagination, my attention, make me want to come back for more? Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so for, right. me, for me, mm-hmm. right, for me, for mm-hmm. me, I, I like, I like sea monsters, right? Oh, I, great. I like, great. Yeah. I like sea monsters. So, so for me, yeah. um, so for example, this year, hammerheads for me were like my dream, mm-hmm. you know, stuff, that, stuff that's big. I love seeing uh, big stuff personally. So I think you have to define what you like to see. I like to see big stuff and I like to see big groups of stuff. So I like uh, big, big schools of like tuna or silvery fish, uh, Trevally, you know, these, these great big, you know, silvery schools that, you know, just, for me, that's just gorgeous and, and beautiful. So I like seeing sharks. Mm-hmm. I like seeing big schools. So I think you would need to define uh, what mm-hmm. you like to see. Some people like to see, you know, a lot of small, colorful kinds of things that don't move so fast. Some people mm-hmm. like crustaceans. 
uh, nudibranchs. I don't know if you've ever heard of nudibranchs. They're, Mm-mm. I think they're the the rough slang is sea slugs. They're like thousands of different color combinations that these things have. They don't move fast. They, you know, they're easy to find. Uh, they're they're nice to see. You can study them and kind of classify them. So there's this all oh, squid. A lot of people like squids and uh, octopi. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, all different kinds of things you could you could focus in on. Okay. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what would happen. Say I am down there, and maybe there's something really cool going on. Um, there's a shark circling, and I'm paying attention to the shark, not paying attention to my meters, um, and I'm running out of air. What's going to happen? All right. Good question. Uh, that should never happen. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, think think of it this way. Uh, so, ha- ha- okay. Have you ever run out of gas in your car? Yes, several times. All right. Okay. Was it ever like a total surprise accident? Like, huh? I never guessed that was about to happen, or I knew I I didn't think there was a risk of that mm. happening, or I didn't. It was totally unexpected. Was it ever like that? Um. Not really. Like I probably thought that I could uh, get farther than I could um, with what I had. Yeah, air is the same way, right? Mm-hmm. It's never a, a surprise. You, you've got a gauge, as what we call it, right? A, mm-hmm. a pressure gauge, yeah. and uh, you know, generally, you know, a good instructor is going to teach you. Um, all right, at certain depths, when you reach this amount of air, you should start coming back or start surfacing. No matter okay. what, right? Mm-hmm. No matter you, you feel good, you feel bad. Uh, you're the first one. You're the last one. You reach this amount. Time to come back. Mm-hmm. And just think about like with, with gas, right? If you thought, mm-hmm. all right, well, if I reach uh, a quarter tank, I'm going to look for a gas station. No matter where I am, if I reach a quarter tank, I'm going to the gas station, right? Mm-hmm. Probably for most of us, depending where you are in the country, if you did that, you'd always be safe. Right. Right. But sometimes you're a quarter tank. You say, ah, my wallet's empty or oh, I forgot my my credit card. or Oh, you know, I'm, I'm on my way to work. It's not a convenience. Oh, it's raining out and the, the gas station doesn't have a cover. You push it. Right. You push it. So that that's the way to get into danger with scuba. It's never a surprise. Okay. It's it's people who are pushing it. Uh, they they're they're taking a chance. They're taking a risk. They're embarrassed is very often the case. They're embarrassed because uh, they don't want to be always the first one to end everyone else's dive or to end my buddy's dive. Oh, so if you run out of air, everybody has to stop. Well, depending on on how your your dive is structured, right? So mm-hmm. at least at least you're going to be ending one other person's dive, your buddy. Mm-hmm. Right. So right. And, and you know if now you why were, if you would were before, I run out of air before my buddy? Good question. So air consumption, it's just like, uh, you know, not everybody has the same uh, aerobic capacity or aerobic uh, fitness. Okay. Uh, that's going to have something to do with it. Uh, relaxation underwater has even more to do with it. The more relaxed you are, the less, uh, the less air you use. Uh, people who are doing a lot of nervous movements underwater mm-hmm. are going to be using more air. Uh, body size, larger body sizes, generally more resistance in the water. So they're gonna. It's gonna take more energy and more air to move. Oh. Smaller people, you know, just the opposite. Well, yep. I can stay down so, there forever then. <laughs> yeah, generally, generally, experience and relaxation are are the real indicators. Okay. So newer divers typically they're gonna use more more air. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. But 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 so get, sorry. So to get back to, mm-hmm. to square one, as mm-hmm. your instructor is gonna tell you, right? Just like you're gonna be checking your buddy every few every few moments. Mm-hmm. As a beginner, you should also be checking your air every few moments, right? Maybe every every two t- two three times you check your buddy, go ahead check your air as well. Okay, that sounds like a lot of meter checking, buddy checking, not so much scenery looking. Okay, you know what? You bring up a great point, but let's let's talk about this. Mm-hmm. Imagine right now you were learning how to how to drive. Right. Now think of how many things you have to check when you're driving. Mm-hmm. Side mirror left, 
Mm-hmm. Side mirror right. Mm-hmm. Rear view mirror. Mm-hmm. Gas gauge, speed mm-hmm. gauge in front of you, off to the left in front of you, off to the right in front of you, road signs, uh, obstacles and condition of the road. Mm-hmm. Now think think about all that, mm-hmm. right? And, yeah. and and you're going to enjoy your, your scenery. So over time, things become automatic okay. and they, they occupy less of your mental space. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Mm. Thanks. Pretty good drivers. I guess they should be a pretty good driver. <laughs> okay. We talked about not letting yourself run out of air. That should never happen. But what if I do? Yeah. Good question. So, uh, or what if you had a failure? Some sort of a failure, right? Uh, unlikely, unlikely, but what if you had an equipment failure that, that did not allow you to breathe, which is a possibility, a remote possibility, but a possibility. Uh, so, are there uh, backups the to that? System, are there like, is there like a plan B for that? Yeah, so on yourself, you're going to have two second stage regulators. Um, so there, there's a potential, there's some degree of backup within yourself, but your best backup system is your buddy. Okay. So your buddy has a backup system also that you would go to if you had a malfunction or if you ran out of air. So that's another reason why the buddy system is important and the distance to your buddy is important mm-hmm. and why you would want to uh, visualize your buddy, right? Be able to see your buddy every few moments and be seen by your buddy. Be kind to your buddy, right? Be in a good position where your buddy can see you easily, right? Generally for me, that's that's next to my buddy or directly behind my buddy. Mm-hmm. Right? Those are the two positions I tend to favor and I'm easy to see. Um, let's talk about panicking is something that I've heard about as that happens to new divers and um, what should I do if I start to feel myself have a panic attack, you know, 30 feet down? Great question. And you know what? This is something that I think about a lot. It's it's rare. Panic, abject panic, panic underwater, mm-hmm. thankfully, is rare. I've only, you know, I have a few thousand dives mm-hmm. and including my teaching dives. And mm-hmm. I've had students like panic underwater maybe a handful of times. I've had out of out of three thousand, I've had maybe I think I think like a handful of panics I've had underwater, and uh, so I've thought about you know how does a person get around panic? Well, one of them is comfort, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, the more you dive, the better your training, right? So for some people, if if you're a person who does not have a lot of in water experience, you didn't grow up with a swimming pool, you didn't go to the ocean. Right. Maybe you had a scary thing happen. Mm. Maybe you didn't learn to, to swim until you were later in life. Mm-hmm. You know, people like that are much more likely to have uh, high anxiety just being in the water. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah. So building your in-water comfort, if you're, especially if you're in one of those categories, mm-hmm. dive a lot. Take a course that's going to maybe take extra time. Okay. Right. Maybe a, a four a four day course, a five day course. Take your time. Get a lot of in-water experience. I like to give those people a lot of pool experience. Um, but then for the average person, mm-hmm. dive a lot. Mm-hmm. Dive a lot, right? The more comfortable you get, right? The more you drive, the more comfortable you are driving, right? If you're a little bit of a jittery driver, when you first learn, the best way is to get in that saddle, drive a lot, mm-hmm. and you're going to be more comfortable. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, yeah, yeah. the more skillful you get at something, the more comfortable. Um, let's see. Narcosis. Um, what is that? Got it. So narcosis is, uh, what do they call it? Rapture of the deep. Rapture of the deep. So okay. it's, yeah, it's not well understood. Uh, it, it, it is depth plus nitrogen. Uh, and it leads to a feeling of, of drunkenness or disorientation. Actually, it, it affects different people mm-hmm. in different ways. And it's not well understood. It's thought that mm-hmm. the nitrogen... Uh, getting into the the membranes of the cell, especially the nerve the nerve cells that are transmitting uh, nervous communication from the brain to to the body, that it messes up with with the those nerve cells and makes us feel drunk. It affects our uh, our coordination. Uh, it affects our awareness. Um, affects our sensations. So things that could happen, you could have. For me, all right. It affects everybody a little bit different, differently. For me, I mm-hmm. feel my lips get warm. 
Okay. And I, my hearing changes, so my my air bubbles, which normally sound like, boop, 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 they sound like ding 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 ding. ding, 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 ding. They turn to bells. So uh, hmm. when I when I feel those, it kind of reminds me of anesthesia. There you go. It's probably very similar, actually. Um, hmm. So. Everybody has a, a different, we call it a tell, like in poker, a tell. So for me, when mm -hmm. I hear those bells and I, I feel that warm buzziness, I know that, okay, I'm at a depth that's affected. And generally that starts in, for some people, like the mid to late 20 meters. So when you're approaching 100 feet, uh, yeah, well, maybe 90 feet for some people. Um, pardon me, I'm, okay. I'm, I speak in metric, so, so most people in, in the, in the mm -hmm. late 20 meters. And so for me, and it also, it's affected uh, sometimes by the environment, low visibility, cold. Uh, if you're in a bad emotional state, um, you know, you can get feelings of panic. You could get feelings of low breath mm -hmm. um, and ascending will stop that feeling if someone had that feeling, right? So, so going back up a bit, if, if it's possible and safe, uh, that would reduce the pressure of the nitrogen inside our body and reduce those uh, those feelings. So, mm. um, when you start feeling narc, do you kind of push through it, or do you just um, surface? It's a great question. A little bit. Great question. So, uh, basically, for me, I plan for it. So, if I'm if I'm mm -hmm. going on air to uh, let's say if I'm going to 30 meters, if I'm going to a wreck, mm -hmm. let's say uh, mm -hmm. we let's say we go to the Keys, uh, Isle Almorada, we go to the Spiegel Grove, a fantastic wreck down in the Keys, and I think the, I mean I think the sand is like 42 meters, maybe the deck starts I don't know 30 meters or something like that. Let's say we go there, and we go down to 30 meter. You know we know we're going to dive to 30 meters, and I'm with my buddy. I'm going to say hey buddy, look it, I'm going to we're definitely going to be narked. Because we're going to be at 30 meters mm -hmm. or 30 meters plus, mm -hmm. we're going to be narked. Um, so right. we're going to be thinking, all right, well, I'm going to be thinking, okay, I want to make sure that I'm okay with that once we're down there. My buddy's okay. You know, we're, we're acting or he's not acting or she's not acting loopy. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to do anything very complicated. So if I were doing a technical mm -hmm. dive and if I had to be doing things with, with reels and lines and tying complicated knots or doing complicated navigations I probably would want to avoid things like that if I thought I was going to be excessively narked right I would mm -hmm. I would think ahead what am I likely to encounter in this dive and would I be up to that if I had a drink or two because <laughs> mm -hmm. that because that's kind of the yeah. effect that's kind of the effect mm -hmm. but uh, right. pe but people also the more you dive deep you do get a bit of a tolerance to it Kind of just like the more mm -hmm. you drink, you know, you're still going to be affected, mm -hmm. but maybe you're used to being affected. And in the worst case, like like you said, actually, if I was down there and I was feeling really bad with my narcosis symptoms, I would call the dive. I'd say hey, to my buddy, hey, mm -hmm. you know what? Let's go. Let's uh, let's thumb this dive. I don't feel good. I don't know if it's the narcosis, if it's the cold. I'm just not feeling it. Let's go. Uh, I'll dive another day. Okay. All right. You've answered all, right. all my questions. All right. I appreciate it. Well, Tammy, thank you. And uh, I, I wish you the best of luck and enjoyment mm -hmm. on your, your scuba thank experience. You. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll check back with you after you're certified. Yeah, definitely. And you've, definitely. Yeah. I'll tell you how it's going. And you've had some adventures. Maybe you've seen a shark or two. You can uh, let us know how that was. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'll definitely let you know how that was. <laughs> All right, Tammy, thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thanks for joining in. Hopefully that was uh, useful for those of you who are thinking to dive in the future. Once again, thank you to Tammy for, for volunteering. She is a friend of the channel and a Patreon of the channel. We do have Patreon down below. If anybody wants to be a supporter of the channel, that's one way that you can do it. Another way is to subscribe if you're not subscribed or to comment or to like. All those things help the algorithm. All right, everybody, thanks a lot for joining in. And as usual, I will see you at the beach.